like the answer. You laid out that there was a role for the federal government as it relates to targets, and I want to understood that I'm very much sympathetic to your point and Senator Barrasso's point that we also have to have a strong role um, for local folks in the states and the like. Apply it now to forestry, where once again we're trying to find a way to get beyond years of gridlock. Now, I've written a proposal for our state. You and I talked about it. It's called the Owen Sea Land. Doubles the harvest in a sustainable way on average for each year for decades while protecting our treasures. There are other ways to go about doing it as well. The Oregon delegation is trying to find some common ground. How do you do it, in your view, without going to sufficiency language which basically has generated, ever since the spotted owl, all the polarization and all the fighting. Well, thank you for the question. It's an excellent question. On the House side, we had the Resilient Federal Forest Act, and what we'd hope would happen was the Senate would pick it up, and then we'd work about between the, on the committees, we'd work together and, and fine-tune it, because there was parts that neither party liked. But overall, it was a pretty good vehicle. In that bill, uh, it, it did not exclude any stakeholder in our forest. And our forest, as you recognize, uh, I'm pretty good friends with, with Chief Tidwell, he's a Region 1 guy. We're 71 million acres behind in removing dead and dying timber. Uh, we need to get to it because the goal should be healthy so you don't have the catastrophic let, fires. Let, let's do this. Would you furnish that answer to me in writing? Yes, I want to know how we bring about the collaboration without sufficiency language. My time is up. I also want to thank you for your support in our bipartisan effort to end fire borrowing, which is this insane budget practice which actually discriminates against preventive forestry, and I appreciate your help. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you Senator Wyden. Senator Daines. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Wyden, uh, I, I echo your comments on collaboration. The other word I hear around tables at coffee shops in Montana besides collaboration is litigation. We collaborate, and then we have agreements, and then some extreme groups stop it in court. We've got to address this litigation issue, too, if we're going to solve the problem. Uh, Representative Zinke, welcome to the committee. It's been a long path from Boy State in 1979 as two juniors in high school to being here today with you. What an honor. Um, thank you. It is wonderful to see your family here. I could not be a prouder Montanan. In fact, uh, when confirmed, you will be the first Montanan to ever serve in a cabinet position in the United States history, going back to our statehood in 1889. So history will be made when you are confirmed. With you at the helm of Department of Interior, you're going to be a strong advocate for our public lands and a strong advocate for American energy. You've made that clear here today. And you have been tenacious in working on behalf of Indian country in the House, representing our 12 federally recognized Indian tribes and the Little Shell tribe and I know you'll be committed to bringing prosperity to their communities. As I say about Montana, uh, we're a unique blend. Uh, we're a blend of Merle Haggard and a blend of John Denver. And mastering that melody is always a challenge. But it does result in a common sense approach on management of federal lands and minerals that can make our country stronger. I think you have mastered that melody which is why I think you've secured the support from such a diverse number of sportsmen, of industry, of tribal groups. There's an impressive list here, <coughs> Representative Zinke, that is single space, two columns wide, of groups that range from the American Fly Fishing Trade Association, who have written letters in your support on your behalf, Boone and Crockett Club, the NRA, the Mule Deer Foundation, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, and these are just a few of the many on this list, not to mention tribes from across the country, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai, Fort Belknap, the Shakopee, the Choctaw, and the list goes on. That is a tough balance to walk. It's a walk of wisdom, and you've walked it well, sir. And I'd like to submit some of these letters of support for your nomination on their behalf today to the uh, committee, if I could, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Representative Zinke, why do you want this job? Well, I've been asked that. Uh, thanks for the question. Thank you for the remarks. Um, I love my country, and I love public lands. 
And I love Teddy Roosevelt's idea that we should think bold and big and prepare for the future. And this job I take very seriously, if confirmed, because it's all that. Um, our country loves our parks and our lands. Our nation should be better equip our Indian tribes with the ability for self-determination. And when the Department of Interior has an influence over a fifth of our territory, that means influencing the beaches in Maine with clams, uh, to our fisheries outside of Hawaii, and even in this body, we're all different, but we all share a common purpose, to make our country great again. And I think as a Secretary of Interior, I think I'll have inherited 70,000 hard-charging, dedicated professionals that want to do the same thing. And my task is to organize for a better future for Interior and our country. I work with anybody, as the list would, would indicate. I've never been red or blue. To me, it's always been red, white, and blue. Politically, I've never asked an individual serving with me next to me, whether they're Republican or Democrat. What's mattered to me is they're American, and they love their country, and they're committed to mission success. And we have a very important mission in the Department of Interior ahead of us. Representative Zinke, a lot of concerns that Montanans have had with previous Department of Interior leaders is that a lot of land use decisions are done with disregard, with, with disregard for the impacts to those who live close to the lands. You've made as an issue of trust and so forth. In fact, as we travel around the state together, one of your favorite lines is a lot of the bureaucrats back here in D.C. couldn't find Montana on a map. Whether it's national monument designations, sage grouse plans, moratorium on coal leasing, too often Montanans face decisions on their public lands that are made by out-of-touch Washington, D.C. bureaucrats. My question is two parts. What are your views on facilitating more local control and management of our federal lands out west? And, and by west, we have a true westerner here, somebody from Montana. And how can we make the Department of Interior look more like Montana and get it closer to the people? Well, great west. Well, great question. And I would say we need to shore up our front line. Uh, if our front line managers don't have the resources, they don't have the flexibility, nor the authority to make the decision they know is right, there's a problem. In the military, it's like being in the front line and asking for a, for a bullet. You've got to go all the way to the, the back headquarters to get a bullet, and when you finally get it, then you've got to ask permission to shoot it. And if you get permission to shoot it, then you've got to ask permission to shoot it what? And that's what's happened a lot of times with our front line managers. We're losing a lot of BLM folks uh, because they've just had it. And so we need to shore up the front line to empower the front line to do good things with broad guidance and understand that their guidance and they should be incentivized on their evaluations of working with local communities. And that's how you do it. You, you reward on an evaluation. How did you collaborate? Did you talk to the local community? Do you have, do you have the local community support? Uh, that's a part of it. So I, I think collaborative efforts work. I think generally they, they deliver the better outcome. Uh, but again, the, my job, or my, I think my most important task is restore trust. That when a BLM truck or a Fish and Wildlife Service truck uh, shows up, one is you want to see management in your eyes and you want to know it's in good hands. Uh, I, I think in many cases we've been too heavy handed as a, as a, as a nation. And, and there's a separation between those living in the land and those managing it. And unfortunately, a lot of times, those managing it, decisions are made here. And you're right. If you don't know the difference between Butte and Bozeman, maybe you're not in the right position to make those decisions. <laughs> your testimony today, I, I first want to uh, thank you for your straightforward recognition that climate change is happening, that human activity is contributing to it, and for also the image of the glacier retreating during lunch. I'm going to add that to my arsenal of climate change uh, uh, anecdotes. Uh, the theme of the hearing today in many ways has been one size doesn't fit all in collaboration and consultation and communication. Uh, you alluded to it, an issue we have in Maine. 
uh, with a national park. There's a national national park rule about you can't exploit natural resources on natural park national parks. On the other hand, in the intertidal zone at Acadia National Park, where people have been digging clams for since time immemorial, suddenly the park decided you can't do that anymore. That to me is an example of of how there should be a better communication and relationship between the park, which is an enormously important asset to the state of Maine, and its neighboring communities. Do you agree? I agree, and I, I, I'm glad you appreciate the theme has been collaboration, uh, restoring trust, infrastructure, and making sure our front lines have the right tools to make the decisions and work with, work with the local communities. And I hope you'll take that message throughout the department uh, about about listen first and, and act later. And, and I think we can have, as you say, a, a restoration of trust and a lot more confidence in the decisions wherever they are made. By the way, if you're going to move BLM out west, you can, you're welcome to move the Park Service headquarters to Maine if you choose. Uh, 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 <laughs> too far away, somebody said. Come on. Uh, backlog. The backlog in the parks is a straightforward problem of funding. We should be funding to pay the maintenance of the parks. We've basically been putting it off for, for 10 or 15 or 20 years. And I hope that you'll approach the next, the upcoming budget as saying, this is part of our obligation to pay the park rangers and to pay all the expenses of the parks and to chip away at this backlog. Will you consider that? Absolutely. And this is why this committee is so incredibly important. Uh, and the chairman in Alaska is so incredibly important because I may own the helicopter, but I have to ask you for the gas. And in order to fund the parks at the level, it goes through this body. Well, we and I have to convince you that the money is going to be spent it will be prioritized. I have to convince the president-elect that the parks are his priority as well. Uh, because they should be America's priority. Well, one point that was made earlier about the backlog, the, uh, I think the, the chairman talked about the, the return on investment is gigantic uh, in terms of what we put into the parks versus what, what they, the economic activity that they generate in, in their areas. So it's a, it's a good investment for the, for the public and, I believe, for the, for the government itself. A, a, a similar concern. We've now, we're now talking about, in recent days, about a major defense buildup. We're talking about a major infrastructure investment. We're talking about major tax cuts. All of those together don't really add up in terms of the arithmetic and the budget and the deficit and the debt. That, therefore, there's going to be a lot of pressure on various areas of the federal government, particularly the non-defense areas. Will you resist stoutly with the heart of a Navy SEAL efforts to raise to partisan fashion to try to get uh, uh, fire funding uh, straightened out? And we haven't been able to do it. Hopefully with the new administration, we have some change. We are going to be able to do it. You know, our, and when you, when you look at the percentages of... Uh, of uh, our states that are owned by the federal government, two thirds in Idaho, substantially more in, in Nevada. It, it and, and I think, uh, uh, S Senator Master, you're going to find that uh, it, it's it's frustrating because the people who live east of the Mississippi are sometimes very cavalier about our problems. And probably one of the poster ch children for that is the is the monument situation. Um, the the president, with the stroke of a pen, be he uh, a Republican or a Democrat, uh, sets aside million or more acres. If this happened to a state back east, people would be up in arms about it. And yet it happens, it winds up on the front page of the paper, and it's gone. Nobody ever thinks about it again. And the, and the collaborative method that has been uh, discussed here uh, is really critical in these public land situations. I did it when I was governor. Uh, uh, Senator Wyden has referred to how they've been doing it in Oregon, and that's the way these things get done. They're going to get done in the future, and the only way uh, that they're going to uh, get done. And a lot of us have introduced a bill that uh, is going to do something about that as far as the monuments are concerned. As you know, uh, cattle ranching has a long history in Arizona, continues to hold a prominent uh, place in our, our present-day state as well as our history. I come from a ranching family. In fact, uh, this last weekend I was back on the F-Bar uh, where I was raised near Snowflake. Uh, ranching is never an easy business, uh, but it's made more difficult with issues like uh, was already raised with the burrows in uh, 
uh, northwestern Arizona and the Mexican gray wolf in southeastern Arizona. Um, what uh, we continue to hear is a lack of cooperation and coordination between the federal agencies uh, and the local land users. Uh, I know that you've already committed to, to work on this. Uh, you'll be hearing a lot when you come to Arizona, uh, the, the issues that we have with wild burrows uh, as well as the Mexican gray wolf issues. And I, I am concerned, quite frankly, about the optic of whether it's BLM or the Forest Service. I grew up where folk was revered. I mean, who could not like Smokey the Bear? Uh, and now in some parts of our, of our great nation, uh, it's feared. When they see Smokey the Bear, they think of law enforcement uh, rather than managing our forests. So I'm very concerned about that because it has implications of the next generation. So we have to, we have to come together and make sure that the management, our, our team out there is, is viewed as helpful, as viewed as land managers, uh, and not to be feared. Uh, you know, you want to stop by and say hello. You, know, you don't want to avoid. And, but I, I, in, in some places, and the further you get out, you know, in parts of Alaska and parts of Montana, uh, they're viewed as, as law enforcement and obstructionists. And, and I, I think we need to be really careful as leaders of this great nation uh, to recognize it and go forward with solutions uh, to make sure the next generation looks at law enforcement, be it BLM or, or Fish and Game, as good neighbors and helpful uh, rather than to be feared. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Franken. Thank you. Let me get this straight. Smokey the Bear isn't real, right? He's real to me, sir. Okay. <laughs> that might be disqualifying. Uh, thank you for your service uh, as a Navy SEAL. Uh, to your daughter's service as a Navy SEAL, to uh, your son-in-law, who frankly terrifies me. I don't know if anyone's looked at him. He's out with your, uh, one of your granddaughters, who, by the way, the granddaughters, you are the unsung heroes of this, uh, uh, of this hearing. You've been wonderful. You have a beautiful family. Thank you, sir. And uh, I, I, I want to... Um, uh, I want to get into what I consider a false choice. And the false choice that I hear you have iterated a couple of times is between addressing climate change and the economy. I think that is a false choice. I think it's a false choice because, one, if we don't address it, it's going to cost us a tremendous amount of resources. Hurricane uh, Superstorm Sandy costs like $60 billion because sea level has, has risen. Glacial Na Na Glacier National Park is going to be Mount, I don't know, Lake National Park or Mountain National Park, but it isn't going to be Glacier in 30 years. Um, in Minnesota, we have built lots and lots of clean energy jobs. And we're addressing climate change. And we've put in a, sta a renewable energy standard. And it's been very successful for our businesses. You signed a letter that, um, that I, in 2010, and I just want to get your, uh, clarify your stance. Uh, in this letter that you, you've urged federal lawmakers, this is a bunch of state legislators who did this, hundreds and hundreds of state legislators, to, quote, pass comprehensive clean energy jobs and climate change legisla leg legislation. Now, this letter also stated that climate, quote, climate change is a threat multiplier for instability in the most volatile regions of the world. And that, quote, the climate change threat presents significant national security challenges for the United States challenges that should be addressed today because they will almost certainly get worse if we delay. I completely agree with that letter. And I ask unanimous consent, Madam Chair, to include this in the record. Thank you. You were a Navy SEAL for 23 years, so you probably know better than most people here uh, about protecting our country. 
I completely agree with your stance in this letter that climate change threatens our national security. The, the Defense Department certainly knows that. It needs to be addressed as quickly as possible. So I want to ask you, do you still feel that climate change is a significant national security threat and one that requires immediate action, or has your position changed since you've been in Congress? That's a great question. Thank you. And well, you're welcome. And I want to be honest with you. Tenants of climate change. One is we both agree that the climate is changing. We both agree that man is at an influence. Uh, not, I think a, a major influence. If you just look at CO2 levels CO2 and how they CO2. parallel with temperature rise, this this is last year was the hottest year on record. The year before was the hottest year on record. Then this is going to be hotter. Well, this is happening, and sea level is rising. And and I'm not I'm not an expert in this field. What I do know, but that that to me is I, a cop out. No, because no one. I want I want to be honest with you. It's I'm not a, I'm not a doctor, but I have to make well, I healthcare realize, decisions. And I and I too sit on on the Natural Resources Committee, and I've went through hundreds of hours of testimony on on all all topics is that there is no model today that can predict tomorrow. So where we agree is we need objective science to, one, figure a model out, and two, determine what are we going to do about it? What do we do? <laughs> and when you, when you say that we want to, on CO2, recognize the CO2's level, absolutely. Recognize also that the ocean is a contributor to it. When a small rise in temperature in the ocean makes a big difference in CO2. So well, it absorbs the CO2. It makes a big difference. makes a big in difference. In sea level. And that means storm surges create tremendous damage and are going to create climate refugees and are going to require, and I know I'm out of time, they're going to be requiring the use of our military if we don't do something about it, and I, don't, I think this is a false choice. We can build an economy, sell to the Chinese, sell clean energy technology. That's what we should be doing. I'm, I'm sorry I've gone over my time. Thank you. We, um, in the discussion about energy, you've said a number of times that you support all of the above, which sounds really great, except that in, in all of the above, what, what's uh, happened is that the fossil fuel side of energy has gotten a lot of support over decades. So I hope that when you say uh, all of the above, that you will also be committed to providing more resources and support, particularly R&D, for alternative and renewables, aside from or in addition to fossil fuels. So we need to have a more level playing field for uh, policies that truly reflect support for all of the above. Yeah, I, I'm, I've always been a strong proponent you know, on the record for research and development of different technologies, different innovations, different opportunities in, in, in this complete spectrum of the energy to include uh, looking at, at traditional uh, sources to make sure we're, we're better at doing that. You know, certainly horizontal drilling, fracking, yeah. coal, but all the above I think is the right approach. Uh, it, it, when it comes out of the test tube and into fielding, uh, energy needs to be affordable, reliable, and abundant. I think, though, when you look at uh, 100 years in the future and you recognize that climate change is upon us and that it is a, um, a multiplier, it's a threat multiplier, and uh, 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 Admiral Locklear has testified to that. So I know serving in the military, you're well aware of 100 years or 30 years from now, we need to do more than uh, continue to, to provide the kind of sustained support that we have provided to the fossil fuel side. Let me get to the question of infrastructure because I'm all for what you're saying about the need to pay attention to the infrastructure needs of the of DOI. But then it's always an issue of how we're going to pay for it, and I'm glad that you're not going to uh, raid the land and L LWCF in order to pay for some 11 billion in infrastructure needs, but since departments do not operate in a vacuum, would you support privatizing Social Security or privatizing, voucherizing Medicare in order to pay for the uh, DOI's infrastructure needs? Uh, well, 
So how are we going to do it? Uh, my my question, and not to evade the 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 answer, but you know, looking at our budget, we spend seventy percent of our budget, you know, in in entitlements, thirty percent in in non or uh, discretionary. We're not going to be able to cut our way out of the problems we have, nor are we going to be able to tax our way out. The only hope of America is to grow our way out, and we can. Energy is part of it. Uh, innovation is part of it, but we're going to need an economy that grows and we can compete. Not only can we, we can compete, we can dominate. God has given us so much. Have, so, um, and I, I, I think we can. The way out of this problem... I hate to interrupt, but I'm almost running out of time and I've waited a, a, a long time. Um, so, yes, you have thank you. Very, very patient. And, so um, it, it sounds to me as though you would look to grow the economy rather than cutting back on, on these kinds of programs that so many people, especially our seniors, rely upon. Um, you know, since talented as you are, you're not going to be able to do the job all by yourself. So you will get, have an opportunity to weigh in on the people who will become your deputies, assistants, etc. What kind of qualities would you look for in those people? Loyalty, teamwork, trust, competence, commitment, uh, and I think in you know each of the d divisions have different challenges. The challenges in BIA is very different than the challenges in Fish and Wildlife and, and BLM. So you have to put the right person in the right spot. Uh, from a SEAL perspective, uh, we need fearless rough riders that will make the decision regardless of whether you're going to get sued or not. Our policy has been whether we're going to get sued, whether it's the right or wrong mm -hmm. policy. And this is where I'm going to need your help. In order to develop the right policy, we should not be in fear of being sued time after time after time again. We should develop the right policy and have people in place that are willing to make the right decision. I hope so. I agree with you. Uh, if, with the chair's indulgence, I'd like to just uh, ask one more question, make a Very point quick. regarding sexual harassment in the, the, um, in the department. And clearly this has been going on for way too long, over a decade when it first came to light in your park service. And so, um, as in the military, sexual assault in the military is a huge scourge on the military. and. Uh, I would want your commitment that you will do uh, whatever you need to do to prevent, which includes changing the culture, by the way. It's a culture within the, the uh, Park Service that, that lends itself to sexual harassment, to that there will be prosecution, meaning that there will be accountability for the perpetrators of this kind of behavior. Uh, and the third is that you will do uh, specific things to prevent retaliation, because these are the very kinds of occurrences and factors that have been a scourge in the military. So I'd like your commitment to toward the, making those kinds of changes, and I certainly will be following up with you. And you have my commitment. It will be zero tolerance, and I will Thank be you. fearless in this. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair.